Welcome to RPV City Talk. RPV City Talk is brought to you by the City of Rancho Palos Verdes to inform the community on recent city matters. RPV City Talk is a weekly show that features the RPV Mayor, City Council, or City Employees. Hi everyone, I'm Liz Brown Swanson and welcome to RPV City Talk. Joining me here in studio is the Mayor of Rancho Palos Verdes, Susan Brooks. It's always great to have Mayor Brooks here to give us your monthly update and all the things going on in our wonderful city. And you have been incredibly busy. I mean, we're yeah, we have. <laughs> Look at all the, the agendas, and these but, aren't even all of them in the last just several weeks. The council's hard at work and staff because in the first week of June, you've already had two meetings. Mm -hmm. um, the big issue, of course, coming up before you right now is the uh, proposed 2013-14 budget for the city. Correct. So let's start right there. You know, how is the budget coming along? What is it looking like? Well, we've gone through three meetings on the budget right now. We have a really great um, overall document here that the council has been working on, which is available online, I might add. And <clears throat> this budget right now for the next year calls for $24.7 million um, as a general fund budget and in our general operating fund. Um, and I, I want to point out that what portion of your tax dollar actually goes into, uh, your property tax dollar actually goes into Rancho Palos Verdes operations. It's 6% of this dollar, which is actually before the one in the $1. Um, 45% is going into some type of educational program, whether it's the school district, uh, educational augmentation funds that were taken from cities and counties through the state. Um, and also there's 3% coming out of the library district funding, 24% for Los Angeles County. So when you get a chance, if you could throw that little dollar bill up on the screen so people can see exactly what the breakdown is, it's excellent. Uh, it really shows you that we're gonna get, we get a lot of bang for the buck. I would in say Rancho so, Pelsfries. considering only, again, getting 6% of the, of the tax dollar going out. You said, though, we might be getting some more property tax revenue coming in. We got an increase on that area? Yes, it looks like we'll have about a 2% increase in uh, property tax revenues as a result of increased sales, home sales, and additions to homes. Um, so that looks very good. So when you look at the budget the city um, works with to do all the things that they do, are you feeling it's adequate? Is it meeting the expectations and the needs of the city in terms of all the things you need to provide our our residents? Well, the city has always had a philosophy of exercising fiscal prudence. And in that capacity, we clearly have done that. What we've also done over the last 40 years is we're celebrating our 40th anniversary is we've increased the level of services due to the level of demand. And we, we have gone um, from being a very um, small scale, bare bones community to a world class resort community in those 40 years. So that is a big stride, but we maintain a very modest budget for that. So when you, you mentioned you can go online and see the budget, I think it's 187 pages. I went on to kind of go through it. Yes, so you I go to so. the uh, city's website, which is uh, palace40s.com right. slash RPV, and uh, you can find the budget under going under the city agendas. It's easy to get to. Um, but overall, you're pleased with where it's going, and it'll come before the council's June 18th meeting. So what happens next? Uh, well, on June 18th, that will be the final ratification. So we have gone through this exercise. We've looked item, line item by line item in many cases, um, and we have ascertained where we are. So we will be voting on this come June 18th. So are there any areas that their cuts are being made that are concerning, or you may have to... No, the only cut areas is that the, the council did agree to do as other area um, cities have done, which is they do that eventually we plan to phase out the, it, it's a, there, there's $50,000 that was allocated as a placeholder for grants to nonprofit organizations, but um, the council did vote and with the uh, abstention of only Councilman Campbell, um, we did vote to phase out this program within two years and to limit the amount and reduce the amount because um, the FAC committee, the Financial Advisory Committee, among um, many others, uh, and common sense <laughs> to a large degree will tell you that it is not the philosophical role of the city to be playing, um, handing out taxpayer funds from the general fund 
uh, to nonprofits of our choice, that that's something we encourage people, and I myself do, and my other right. colleagues do as well, but for us to use taxpayer funds is a different use of that money. I have to say it puts you also in a difficult position, I would think. We have so many great causes in our community. We have 150 nonprofits alone, I think, on the Hill, so where do you... Kind of draw the line. Where do you draw the line? It becomes it's difficult. It's painful, and it's actually, we felt like at some point it was probably insulting for the people who were there. You know, you're doling out 5000 here or 3000 there. It's, it's wow. Right. And then for some of them, we dole out the money, and then we get the money back in another program, and so much is lost in administrative fees that the best thing to really do is, um, is cut that particular program. No other Peninsula City has it, and... Other area cities um, use community development block grant monies or Quimby funds, which are not available to us. Um, and if they do have some general project, that would be something special. So overall, you're pleased with the budget, how the budget's shaping up and the city's financial picture overall. I mean, we have a healthy reserve in place, so. We have a very healthy reserve, yes. Uh, and, uh, but by the same token, even though our reserve is healthy, uh, we always have to watch for that rainy day because that rainy day vis-a-vis -vis Altamira Canyon, um, now that we've funded the San, well, now that we have the San Ramon um, storm drain project underway, uh, we still have to look at how we're going to fund the rest of that program, even though there was a state matching grant for nine and a half million dollars. We still have the other nine and a half million to fund. Right. So that's another reason why um, you have to choose what it is the city's primary function is. It's, it's not to hand out grants, it is to make sure that the infrastructure and right. the public safety needs are being met by the people. And since you've moved on to the San Ramon, I just want to, um, it did come up at your June 1st meeting in terms of looking at funding options, so what, what are you considering at this point? Well, we did have a um, presentation at the uh, budget workshop last Saturday by Tim Schaefer, our financial advisor. And they suggested that we wait to look, we were looking at um, financing options, debt financing, that before we actually take that into account exactly what we'd want to do with that remaining money, uh, whether we want to perhaps finance three million or five million of that or seven million, uh, the fact is that we need an overall infrastructure report card and that needs to be done by doing an assessment of what our overall 60 to 70 year old storm drains, sewer systems, roads, everything is wearing down. And we need to find out the long-term project of what's, what's going to be there, the problems that we're going to be facing. Right. So once we have a, a real figure there, I, I think this city is in a really good position to be able to go forward with that kind of a program. Of course, the community for so many years has been hearing about San Ramon as probably one of the biggest issues and goals um, because it, it's just an, it is you know so important to get that all resolved over there. And so I'm going to continue on on this subject because at the uh, last meeting, uh, the June 4th meeting, San Ramon came up during public comments. Um, there was one resident there concerned about basically, um, as I was watching the meeting from home, that, that she was concerned about something part of the bidding process and what's going on. Can you, if it, those that watched that meeting and were confused or didn't know what was going on, explain how this impacts San Ramon right now? What, what happened? Well, in a nutshell, without actually going into too much detail, because this came up under public comment right. items, and really we are not supposed to take issues on the agenda that are not agendized to the extent that we could address some of it. The uh, staff was able to say that, and, and we gave direction to the staff to come back at the next meeting with a further exp explanation for um, this individual and anybody who may have additional questions about it. But we did vote two weeks ago to um, allocate, um, there was a change order in the actual project concerning the type of pipe that was going to be used. Now, I am not an engineer. I am not a geologist, and neither is this individual, but the professionals who did look at this and did see that this, this change order came through um, uh, were very comfortable with the fact that, um, in addition to the fact that this was a uh, suitable replacement pipe, that this particular pipe also um, saved the city money. It, and we were getting a refund in the amount of $315,000. Uh, and we're ex exercising continued fiscal prudence. So as we move forward, we just have to remember the, the key goal here is really to move forward um, and know that 
we are exercising not only fiscal jurisprudence, but also safety. Right. And, and safety is the key issue. And, and um, all of these professionals are, are confident that this is the safest way to go about this. And so the council action during that meeting was basically it'll come back up to answer the yes. questions, the concerns yes. of, of that resident, but the project's still moving full speed ahead right now. Well, the project is moving ahead right now no, unless the speed, city, um, unless the council decided to have a um, call another meeting. Um, but it's my understanding that the pipe has been ordered and this is moving forward. You know, we've been waiting seven years to get this project going. Um, there are some individuals who felt that there may have been a better way to go about this. Um, there are various individuals who have had a part in it. And once the decision was made to go with um, this particular contractor, um, we move forward. So any questions that arise about other bids that pay may have come in at the end after the clock, you know, struck right. 12 and whatever, all those things are issues that can be addressed at a later time. But the fact is, um, when you don't open a bid package, you will have no idea how much money actually um, that individual says that they came in under the actual bid and, and if they were late, why did, why did they sit in the car and wait right. to deliver something a minute late? Right. Why wouldn't they deliver it an hour early? I mean, of course, you're referencing the fact that you did end up getting a bid that was that late, was and you late. can't, by the state law, right. accept that, and that came up as well. Right. So you're juggling a lot in that area. But um, other big projects, you were, um, the, the June 1st meeting, staff presented you with what's a draft five-year capital yes. improvements plan, but right. you'll be sifting through all that next, and I'm sure there's lots of projects in well, the city. Yes, and, and it's prudent for us to have a draft five-year projection plan, even though we're only allocating for the one year, you know, we're looking at $9 million that's funded, but the guideline and the projects, these are only looking at projects that are over $100,000 a piece. So these are general uh, infrastructure projects. That's what the CIP is, it's Capital Improvement right. Plan. And it, and it has to do with the, um, the storm drains, the sanitary sewers, the, uh, the general plan updates, the pump, the trails network, you know, which is extensive now that we've got the 1,400 acres in the preserve. So the fundamental infrastructure needs of the city over the next five years, okay. which actually kind of ties into that report card that's going to be needed. Okay. You mentioned the preserve, so I think that'll just move on to my next question I had here for you with our beautiful open space we have. Um, the Palos Fortes Peninsula Land Conservancy has started a trail watch program which was, I guess, at your June 1st meeting, the council then decided to participate in. We did. Explain what's hap what this program's all about and the need for it. Well, the, the trails program and the, and the preserve have um, long been looking for some type of structure and some type of organization because you have a variety of activities taking place in this, in this one environment. Uh, you have equestrian, um, you have people on horseback, you have cyclists on bicycles and dirt bikes, you have pedestrians who are walking, and not to mention all the other little critters out there, the snakes and everything else that are out doing their thing. And we'll talk about them later. So this is an attempt to actually um, be the eyes and the ears, much like we have our volunteers on patrol for our regional law enforcement committee. We have volunteers in the sheriff's department. These are volunteers that are um, both cyclists and pedestrians and equestrians that will be there to help to largely educate. This is largely an educational program. Um, individuals about the proper activities that are permissible within the preserve. Because if it became a situation where it got out of control, the city actually owns the land and the conservancy actually is, is hired it. to maintain it and to, to manage it. So we need to make sure ultimately that public safety, which is job one, is actually taking place. And again, the, the Land Conservancy pushing this sort of this volunteer trails watch program was there are it, some issues with um, some of the user groups, that, you know, I think uh, with the veg um, the habitat out there being destroyed, whether it's from, you know, people, bikers or whatever. So is that really the issue to get out to make sure that the preserves being not being um, 
abused? Well, part of it is for the preserve, yes, but uh, another part of it is to make sure that um, people are, are being mindful of um, proper etiquette when you're, when you're there. I mean, if you're spooking a horse because you're bounding down, the, you know, bounding down the trail on a dirt bike, or you're scaring individuals who are hiking, um, that doesn't work. Right. And so one of the goals is to get the cyclists out there themselves, because they've been excellent in monitoring this. Um, uh, Kurt Lohite was at the meeting on Saturday, and Barbara Ayler will be actually the volunteer trails watch manager. And there, there will be an advisory committee working with them and the city as well. So mm -hmm. there will still be that connection. With okay, the city. well, you can give us an update and how that's all coming that's together. Praying. I know, but um, <laughs> that works we are well. so thankful to have that in our backyard. I know that I, because I live by Ladera Linda, I'm up in the trails in almost daily hiking, and it's just unbelievable. It's like, it is. You, just, you are in paradise when we you're up there. We do live in paradise. You, you keep, I just look just, at it. We I are know. so blessed. Some issue really important to you is um, you're part of vector control and what's happening with West Nile virus. So not to alarm people, but to inform them. I think that people need to be made aware. First of all, I'm, I'm the city's representative for the West Vector, the Los Angeles County West Vector Control Board. And uh, we, we have several cities that participate in this. Um, uh, I, there are some actually great pamphlets of information that you can receive. Uh, you can actually call them and they will mail them to you at um, area code 310-915-7370. Uh, that's area code 310-915-7370. And they have a pocket guide here to biting and stinging insects. And this is very, very helpful. And in our studies, you will see they're also on the website, and our agendas are posted on the website at the, um, for the vector control. And their website is lawestvector.org, and I'm sure you'll put that Absolutely. up on, on there as well. But just so that people know, back in, um, and then they'll send you this nice little kit so you can... Swap that, those. That could come handy. Swap whatever that you want. Come handy. I can think about meeting. using this at a council <laughs> meeting. Actually, this is a lot better than just swatting a mosquito. But um, the fact is that um, the West Nile virus is a very deadly virus, and it keeps mutating. It changes consistently every single year. And uh, now Texas has had a tremendous problem, the largest in the nation. California is coming in second. And uh, when we look at these statistics, you can see that uh, this year there was one found in Lomita in March. And we thought, okay, that was it, we're fine. Now, just this, this week, um, they found, um, I'm not even sure if it was one or several, uh, testing positive in Machado Lake, home of, former Reggie. home of Reggie the alligator. Uh, so that, they are spraying that right now. Uh, you know, it's ironic that they're spraying that lake, and uh, they do have to do that. They do have to spray for that. But we just put in money to help with it detention basin for trash in that area, um, along with Torrance is the overseer city of, I believe it's five cities. Mm -hmm. So we have a stake in Machado Lake as well, even though it's over there near where the Kaiser Permanente um, facility is at Vermont and, Pal and PCH. Right, we need to keep our Harbor surrounding city. communities healthy and all of that environmentally. Yeah, it's, it's, it's very close, but Harbor City, believe it or not, is not part of West Vector Control, but it doesn't matter. They're just as close as, uh, right. they're far closer than <clears throat> um, Sentinella Avenue, where I have to go up to those meetings up in... Uh, so that you have that one case, so warning Culver to the resident city. how to make sure that you're keeping your property... Um, not a place yeah, where you the can harbor this. Yeah, uh, that's a really good point. The things to do are to make sure that you... Um, that, and, and also there are these other mosquitoes that are coming out, Liz, in the daytime, and they're biting, uh, and they're not innocuous, but they're also not deadly. But uh, they're, they, these new breeds of mosquitoes are, it's just the slightest bit of water, um, like the bottom of a watering can. I used to have my watering cans all filled. Now they're all empty. Everything you water, you water at the time don't have any stagnant water, even at the bottom of your little potted plants. Mm -hmm. That's what they love. And uh, a lot of those mosquitoes came over uh, about a decade ago on one of those container ships from China 
where they were carrying the bamboo plants. Oh. You remember those money plants? They call them the bamboo plants. Many people still have them today. Right. And they were actually sitting in the perfect environment for them. It was an inch and a half of water, and it was very, very hot inside there. And when it was open, there was... So, you know, when we are this close to the port, we're vulnerable for a lot. So we have to be right. very mindful. And this vector control district is outstanding. And if someone might they, think they've been infected, how do you know? Are those, is it like flu-like symptoms or what happens? Do you know? You do have flu-like symptoms, but you really, the best thing that you can do is to go and get checked. Right. Because um, the, uh, the symptoms, uh, it mutates differently. The symptoms change. Um, it's not necessarily curable per se, but it is something that you can live with um, with the proper treatment. Mm -hmm. So, so, um, so moving on then. So we've kind of covered that. You've got great really information. Like this. Yeah, I'm really getting Get into away the from thoughts of this. She's about to swap me. <laughs> um, the next question. Um, we'll move on to some of the other count, big things council has been dealing with or council actions. Um, uh, we just had a rate adjustment request that you approved for the city's uh, trash haulers, um, Edco and UWS. Is that right? Is that, universal waste. Well, yeah, universal waste. And uh, what happened there? What? what was well, that what happens is they are on a contract that is a seven-year contract. So with this contract, we are now in the third year of the seven-year contract. Um, by and large, the, the service has been working well. Uh, by and large, it's received uh, both EDCO, particularly EDCO, I would say, has received um, a lot of kudos mm -hmm. from the community um, in universal waste. Uh, but it amounts to about 50 cents a month uh, of an increase. And the increases that you would see, they cannot be a response, they cannot be a response to any kind of um, personal gain, but they have to have something to do with actual expenses incurred. So the gasoline prices factor in. But a large factor I was surprised to see is the surf. S-E-R-R-F ever in um, Long Beach facility, our recycling plants are costing more money to get these to replace and, um, and move materials over to the recycling facility. So that's where the increases, they have to be justified as an actual expense, not as some kind of a personal gain to the uh, carrier. Right. Of course, one way to make your 50 cents back, if you really want to, is you. I love that at the beginning of your council meetings, you Get award Get your $250. The re so, okay, I don't know, the recycling of the, you always give a $250 award to the best right. recycler. How does, how well, do you, no, does that they work? Well, no, they do. We have a bin. We, I'd like to go back to the bin. I mean, we used to turn that bin, you know, and <laughs> pull the name out, but it takes time. But it's fun. It's kind of like being Bob Barker. And, and you get it for being a doing a lot of recycling that and and you get 250 dollars and we thank the people for recycling and but that's because the people have signed a little form I and see. sent it in uh and uh they just get chosen randomly right. and then they also get an emergency preparedness kit which is worth 60 dollars um nice. so that's very very helpful so we've just kind of gone through some of the highlights of the last few meetings or the first week of June. Anything that I didn't bring up before we move on to what happens at the end of each meeting? I've always wanted to talk to you about this, where the council um, talks about all the things that you're doing outside of what we see at that council meeting. I mean, you have so many committees you sit on, so many things oh. that you do. Um, talk a little bit about There's some of the assignments you have. We only have a couple minutes here to go, so just highlight a couple yeah, of the I things you've I, been working you know, on. I would point out that for anybody who's ever interested in running for this um, position to acknowledge, to, to really know that it requires more than showing up at a council meeting every other week. Um, it requires a lot more. It really requires you roll up your sleeves and you dig down not just into this work, which is a sizable amount of work, but there are responsibilities that we have as participants in the greater community around us. One of them is PV Transit. Um, PV Transit um, transports a lot of our students and adults. We have a dial-a-ride program uh, for $5, which will now, I believe, be going to $6 um, once we've made our presentations to all the councils. I'm the representative there, uh, Jim Knight. Councilman Knight is um, my alternate there, um, but that that is essential, yet that program, we are subsidizing to the tune of over $21 each way. So it's a $30 trip around on the peninsula, which you're getting for five bucks, it'll soon be $6. Mm -hmm. But if you go off the, the hill to Torrance for a hospital treatment where most of our regulars do, 
then that becomes $10, but it's still a fantastic deal. The problem is we've got to figure out how we're actually going to pay for these things. There's no means testing either. So it could be somebody who has a lot of money where there's no problem, um, or you know, somebody who actually really does need the help. But many students have to get to school and they use PV Transit to do so. We have the MTA 225 and 226 lines, which are used uh, a great deal. And I, you know. So dealing with PV Transit, you're on a committee for PV Transit? Or yes, what that we meet together, thank you. We, uh, we meet together with the other peninsula cities that are involved in PV Transit. Obviously, Rolling Hills is not because they don't have a, trans a right. transit system there. But it's pa Palos Verdes Estates, Rolling Hills Estates, and Rancho Palos Verdes. We are 20% of the funding. Um, they are each like 5 and 6%. We, get, we have been fortunate that Don Kanabi, our, our county supervisor, has um, funded us, helping us with this essential service. But we can't rely on those kind of funds. We have to really look for advertising, um, other ways, more creative ways. So this is just one of the many committees that's taking up your time on behalf of the community. You also, you know, there's contract cities. There's your monthly uh, lunch. You have a mayor's lunch, right? Yes, we have a mayor's luncheon right before the sanitation district meeting. And what that is, it, it, it's members, of, leaders on the peninsula, people who serve on the, the head of the library district board comes, uh, someone from the school board usually the president, uh, and then the Peninsula Cities, and it started, I believe, many, many years ago. When I was on the council 20 years ago, that was going on as well. So it started well prior to that, I believe when the city first got started. And then slowly it grew to include the whole peninsula. And what's great about that, Liz, is we get to learn what each of the cities and schools are in the, in the library district. We share information about what we're all doing. We advertise each other's causes and programs and activities, and mm -hmm. uh, we're able to share in, uh, we share the same landmass, so we have some good emergency preparedness activities coming up that we're gonna work on together. Well, I appreciate you sharing everything today. We're out of, out of time, but we also wanna remind our community, you'll be there, 4th of July party, big yeah, one, great. right here at City Hall. So it's gonna be from 10 to five on the 4th. It's a tradition and uh, a it's special great. day. It's like, it's, it's well, almost as good as mom's apple pie. Yeah, there's a pie eating contest that you'll be part and, of. And, you know, they have the helicopter rides. Uh, it's a, yeah, the pie eating contest is great. I just don't like to be the judge because I like to narrate. Let all those other people do the judging because some of those, especially the little children, they're so adorable. But the adults, they wolf up that piece so quickly. <laughs> I could never spot the difference between who got well, it first. It's a fabulous day it's to fun. bring the community together and, and celebrate. And music and the rides and... Big the arts and crafts, it's what America, it's a real great way to celebrate our independence. There you go. That'll do it for this edition of RPV City Talk. Thank you, Mayor Brooks, for Thank being you. here. Thank you for always. having me. It's no, great to be great here to with have you. you. We hope to see you at the 4th of July party and all that fun stuff. Until our next show, we'll see you next time. Thanks for watching. Okay.